Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists. Executive Director and Co-Founder, 100K in 10, Talia Milgram Elcott. Director, Education, Overdeck Family Foundation, Anu Malapatel. General Manager, Social Innovation, Toyota Motor North America, Michael Goss. CEO and co-founder, St. Bernard Project, Zach Rosenberg. And our moderator, co-founder and CEO, Social Finance, Tracy Palangin. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session. Um, we're delighted that you've joined us bright and early to have a really fun conversation uh, with our excellent panelists. The topic, as you can see, is about partnerships, and CGI America has had this long held and, um, and, and affirmed commitment around building partnerships, and this morning we'll get a chance to hear about a couple of quite uncommon partnerships um, to achieve some fairly audacious goals. So what I'd like to do is um, have a conversation with our four panelists here. And then this is a small enough group that we can even turn this into a living room. And the last 20 minutes or so, we're going to have a Q&A session. So throughout the process, do think of questions, write them down, uh, and we'll get a chance to address your questions toward the end. So what I'd like to do is start off by uh, introducing our panelists um, and ask them about the project that they came together, both of, of, of our uh, partners here. Their projects were announced in 2011. Uh, at CGI and CGI America, respectively. So um, first of all, Talia and Anu, and, and you can see their illustrious biographies in your book, uh, but both of them have had just this extraordinary background in philanthropy, in the public sector and the private sector. They are almost like a public-private partnership <laughs> into themselves. Um, so before I introduce the gentleman over there, maybe we can take the first um, few minutes to talk about what exactly is 100K and, and 10, and how did you guys come together? So Talia, I'll, I'll have you just give us a quick brief overview. Perfect. Hi, good morning. I, 100K in 10 is a response to President Obama's call in the 2011 State of the Union Address for 100,000 excellent science, tech, engineering, and math, or STEM teachers, in 10 years. When he put out the call, it was one of those moments of hearing an urgent and necessary call for change. And you could feel the ripple of agreement throughout the country. Of course we need 100,000 excellent STEM teachers. Of course every kid. Um, facing uh, the economy and the changes that we're seeing in the 21st century needs strong STEM skills if they're to be competitive, if our country is to continue to be globally competitive, and perhaps even more important, if we're to solve the big challenges that we face as a planet and that confront us also as a, as a nation. So here is this critical and urgent call for change to ensure that all kids have a chance to learn STEM skills because they have great STEM teachers in front of them in the classroom. And it was as if, in the same breath, you could feel the shrugging of the shoulders and the inevitable impossibility of this goal. 100,000 excellent STEM teachers? Like, this is not possible. We don't, we're never going to be able to deliver on that. And it was in that moment, I was at the time at Carnegie Corporation of New York, which is a national foundation with a historic focus on teachers and a more recent focus on STEM, that we decided that this time could be different. And though no single agency, no government, um, could actually deliver 100,000 excellent STEM teachers, perhaps a network could. Perhaps we could catalyze a response in which organizations across the spectrum from every sector could see themselves as critical allies to bringing this goal to reality, could deliver from their own unique resources and assets, the things that make them great, their own strengths, and could contribute that to a collective goal. And so we set out trying to build that thing, and that thing is 100K in 10 started as 28 organizations on stage at CGI America in 2011. And at the time, they wouldn't even let us make a goal for 100,000. Like the commitment was for 20,000 teachers over three years, because 100,000 seems so far off. And uh, 28 organizations stood up on that stage, made this commitment, each of them contributing something unique. We're now 280 organizations, five years later, and announced earlier this year uh, with President Obama that the American Institutes of Research had validated that we were on track and on time 
to deliver 100,000 teachers by 2021. That's extraordinary. So how is it going right now? So four years in, we're just, we, audit, we audit every fall for teachers who finish their certification over the summer and are starting classrooms right now. Uh, but we expect to, to announce that we're 40,000 teachers trained to date. Again, by 280 partners around the country, some of whom are training new teachers, some of whom are supporting those teachers to stay in classrooms and to improve. And more yet, like the Overdeck Family Foundation and like other organizations that are building this movement, changing the operating environment, changing policy, funding these organizations, those collectively have trained 40,000 teachers in four years. Five Wait, Tali, you mean you actually train these 40,000 teachers yourself? So we don't do it okay. ourselves. It would be nearly impossible for us to train <laughs> these teachers uh, in all the different disciplines for every single state right. in the union. But now more than you know, 150 partners are directly training these teachers in all the different, all 50 states of, of this country and um, have together trained and put into classrooms 40,000 teachers in the first five years and we actually hit the 20,000 goal in three years. That's extraordinary. So Anu, how did you come into the picture? Yeah, good morning everyone. Um, so we came into the picture about three years ago. We joined Fund 3 in 2013 and from our perspective, we were an emerging foundation. We were a team of two at the time. Um, and for us, um, we really saw 100K and 10 as a really innovative funder collaborative, an opportunity for us to be a part of a learning journey and community and to join alongside 34 other um, foundations and corporations along Google and Chevron and AT&T and Gates and Carnegie and Simons and MacArthur. Um, and so it was, for us, it was really just a, uh, an entry point for us. So there's a new STEM funder, a new foundation, um, and uh, the way that 100K and 10 is structured from a funder perspective is that um, funders maintain autonomy of their, of their um, f uh, funding dollars, and so we can uh, directly fund a nonprofit within the network that's been pre-vetted by 100K and 10. Um, uh, the funding, so and actually 100K and 10 doesn't take any pass-through dollars, even though they provide lots of services and sort of opportunities for funders um, to sort of get up to speed. So for example, as a team of two, um, we were like building our own processes and I was thinking about our staffing and our hiring and 100K and 10 had already done all the diligence on the nonprofits and their network. So for us, it was sort of a really, um, it was an entry point to say, all right, we trust the vetting process and we can, we feel comfortable um, and confident that these partners are you know, best in class and high quality people that we want to be around. And so for us, it's just been a really fun learning journey and it's been um, a really fun partnership with Talia and the 100K and 10 team. That's fantastic. So we're gonna come back to yeah. some of these questions, especially when I heard about the 280 partners. I mean, how does one even manage that kind of network, <laughs> right? So that's definitely gonna be a question. But I wanted to uh, make sure that um, everyone gets uh, the landscape of uh, the other extraordinary commitment, which is represented by Mike Goss of the Toyota. Um, now, it, Mike, your, your title is really interesting. Social innovation at Toyota. Like, why is this guy at Toyota even sitting here on this stage working on social innovation? So when I met Mike last year, I, my mind just opened. And, uh, and Mike has such an extraordinary background too. And I read in your bio this morning that you were once a photographer and a journalist and an editor. You know, this guy is multifaceted. <laughs> anyway, and then Zach Rosenberg, um, just such a leader in disaster recovery and relief, um, having founded the St. Bernard Project, which you'll hear about right now. But uh, Zach's background is also extraordinary. You know, he was a criminal defense lawyer for many, many years. And then, um, well, you, you'll tell us about your journey. So You've got a lawyer and a journalist sitting here, <laughs> so I'm not sure we're the most popular people in the room. <laughs> Uncommon partnerships. Um, there you go. Tell us about your partnership and, 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 and tell us a challenge for Zach uh, that you were hoping to address back in 2011. Sure, thanks. Good to see everybody. And before I get started, there, there's one thing I'd like to do that hasn't happened yet. If there are some CGI people in the room, can we give them a, a massive round of applause for their investment over these last years? I remember the 100,000 um, K and 10 commitment when it was made, and I thought, uh, 
they're not going to do it. It's kind of showy. And it really shows <laughs> the value of CGI. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> well, what I, I'm now, like, my heart's thumping seeing the impact that you've caused. They over-delivered. Well, I know. And so I, I think it's just fantastic. And so I, I just hope that when we're all out in the world and people ask us about CGI, we talk about the lives that are being changed in this unique forum that's not about talking, that's about doing. So kudos for the good work. Um, so our challenge was this. We were a lawyer and a teacher running a construction company. Um, our quick story was 20 pounds ago in 11 years, I was a criminal defense lawyer in Washington, D.C. With my dream job, I, was a, I had a small practice and I taught at Georgetown Law School. After Katrina, my then girlfriend, now wife, and I went to visit New Orleans um, to volunteer for two weeks, six months after the storm. And we got to know these people who were like our family. You know, we ate every meal with them, we worked with them. And after, there was no path forward. It was like staring into the abyss. And so after two weeks, we couldn't tell these people, good luck, have a nice life, hang in there. We stayed for two more weeks and we had to throw the money at it theory. We we're gonna figure out who's building houses, raise some money for them, and then get back to our lives. And when we went to all these big organizations and we said, when are you gonna start building? We got this very cavalier answer which was we've done disaster recovery the same way for the last 30 years. Why would we change? Building is phase three. Um, so with that, we moved to New Orleans. And because we knew nothing about disaster recovery, nothing about the nonprofit industry, we had no mentors, we didn't see a future in this, we were really liberated. And we could build this all under one roof, vertically integrated model that was driven by outcomes rather than any historical ties to the way things have always been done. And when we met Mike and his colleague five years ago, we, great things had happened. We had built more houses than any other group. We were on the cover of US News and World Report. My wife had won the CNN Hero Award. But it was a unique time, and we were working in one community, New Orleans. We weren't getting any better. We had plateaued. And what we saw, it kind of hit us that five years into the recovery, there were still tens and thousands of American families some of whom back then were living in FEMA trailers, tons were living in gutted homes. It was really a, a human rights crisis, we think, in America. And we realized we had to get better, and we understood from Toyota that they had this training entity uh, that would make us better. So that was the problem we faced. How could we do more houses, higher quality, faster, for less money? So Mike, you came into the picture, and what did you offer the guy? Well, you may be wondering what an automotive company is doing in the disaster response and recovery field. Um, first of all, I think it's important to know Americans expect companies of our size to, you know, write checks when a disaster happens, and, and we had been doing that as a routine. Um, but we feel like we have so much more to offer to society. And in this case, we have a team of people who share the Toyota production system with U.S. businesses and with nonprofits. Um, you know, the Toyota production system is uh, world renowned. Uh, there's lots of consultants out there who are, uh, I'm gonna be nice, they're, <laughs> they're trying to help organizations get better, but um, there's nothing like getting that expertise from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And um, in Zach's organization, we saw an opportunity to help him build homes faster. Again, he said he was a lawyer and a school teacher and running a construction company. And in fact, that construction company is staffed with AmeriCorps and volunteers. Um, so what we did is help them see the gaps in their processes because home building was taking way too long. And our guys helped uh, cut the home rebuilding process by 50%. Wow. I, thank you. Um, Make it tangible for me. So tell okay, me about yeah, I, I will. I, I really want to tell you a story which was kind of a seminal moment for me um, because our re relationship with St. Bernard has grown beyond just the Toyota production system uh, thinking. We, every, every time he finishes a home, um, they have a little ribbon cutting ceremony for the family to come home. And the first one I witnessed, um, there was just this handsome young boy named Paul Jones, and he was cutting the ribbon uh, on his house. 
he was maybe five years old when Katrina hit. And for the next several years, he lived in Houston, San Antonio, Atlanta. And then when he got back to New Orleans, he was living on friends and relatives' homes, sleeping on their couches. He was doing very poorly in school. When he got back home a few weeks later, he's like named most improved student in his school. And he was proudly showing us, one of my colleagues in the audience was with me that day, and he was proudly showing us this plaque he got. And it really dawned on us that this is not about process, this is about people. And when you see still 11 years after Katrina, the, the devastation and the scope and thousands of families still aren't home, um, that makes us want to get more engaged. And we have our, we have so much more to share. We continue to help them with processes, although they've become their own expert. Um, in fact, you should just have the SBP production system, frankly. They've, and they're now training other nonprofits on how to do these kinds of things um, in a better way. We're going to supply other expertise. Um, I'd like to make their operation zero landfill. Mm. Our plants are zero landfill, and, and he has waste on a construction site. Let's figure out how to eliminate, eliminate that waste. Um, he has AmeriCorps and volunteers building homes. Safety's a huge, you know, focus area. We have safety experts who can help him. We uh, put together a fleet of about 20 uh, vehicles, trucks, so he can uh, do this work around the country. Uh, they're Toyotas, by the way. <laughs> I think that's important to note. Um, and there is an infusion of cash because he does have to uh, operate. The whole idea now is to level up the organization's capabilities so that they can serve the entire country, not just New Orleans. So now, Zach's working all over the country where there's been floods in West Virginia and in South Carolina and in Baton Rouge. And um, we're pretty proud of that at Toyota that we've helped level up his capabilities to serve more people. Congratulations. It's um, extraordinary what you've been able to achieve. I'm going to now pose a question to, to all the panelists because, as you can appreciate, the arc of that partnership has really changed over time, and Mike began to touch upon that. And I think there was a famous Henry Ford quote that said, you know, coming together is the beginning, uh, keeping together is progress, and, and actually staying together over time and having these enduring partnership is the true success. Can you reflect a little bit on maybe Tali and Anu first, how your partnership has changed over time and five years ago versus now and what you hope to achieve in the future? And then I'd love to pick up uh, from your perspective, Zach, kind of what, what Mike said earlier. So when we started the 100K in 10, it was 28 organizations from across sectors. So there were corporations, uh, Google was there from the beginning, there were foundations, there were nonprofits, there were school districts, there were government agencies. Uh, but it was a tiny number of us. And at the time, the, the hope was that we could get to this goal if we simply got great organizations to come together and make commitments. And we set about creating a process where organizations had to be nominated and then they, were, they would apply and they were vetted by the University of Chicago, we brought in a third party to keep it honest. And everyone was making these strong commitments and we're like, this is it, we've totally hit on this new model. We joked that it wasn't your grandfather's coalition. This was a, a new way of doing coalitions in which the, the coin of the realm, so much like CGI and so much inspired, sort of coming together with the same, same vision was about action. So you couldn't just sign on, like a sign-on letter, or you couldn't just sort of join a coalition and go back to business as usual. You needed to make a commitment to do something above and beyond what you would have otherwise done. And we set about doing that for about a year, and we grew from 28 organizations to 100, and we, we paused and looked around and realized we had these incredible commitments but commitments on paper not realized were not much better than a sign-on letter. And what we needed were organizations to succeed at those commitments. But these were ambitious commitments, and these were hard-driving organizations already with full plates. And if they were going to succeed at their diverse and ambitious commitments, we needed to play a role to help them get there. We worked with funders to build a fund. We've now raised more than $90 million in pledges from these 35 incredible funders from around the country. 
uh, of which almost 80 million has already been spent directly to the nonprofits uh, doing this work, but we also invested deeply in learning. President Clinton spoke to the group in 2012, and he said something more or less like, if you give us 100,000 excellent STEM teachers, that will be pretty great. Like, you'll, you'll change the progress of this country for the next decades, and that's, that's all well and good. But if you help organizations to learn from each other and to do more of what works and less of what doesn't, that will change the nonprofit sector. So we set about figuring out how do you do that? How do you create an environment in which organizations can genuinely learn from one another? We realized to genuinely learn from one another, you needed to be willing to be vulnerable. You had to be able to admit what you didn't know. And if you're going to be vulnerable, you needed to trust. You needed to know that this organization, that we have your back, you need to trust us, but at least as important, you needed to trust the other organizations in the network. You needed to be able to say to them, I'm great at this stuff and I've really figured this thing out, but I'm really struggling over here. Can you, can you help me? Where can I partner? Who can I learn from? And so we invested really deeply in creating these opportunities for people to know each other, to trust each other, to be willing to share and learn from one another as the foundation for growing. And then we said, wow, there are these really big challenges that people are facing, and they're facing them almost always alone in their silos. And we talked to a small private university in the Northeast and to a huge public system in the Southwest or in, in California. We talked to charter schools and to big public school dis um, districts, and we'd be hearing the same challenges over and over. And we realized that part of the role of 100K and 10, uh, because we were this national network, was to map all these challenges that we could see and we could hear from all these organizations all of the challenges that people were facing, that they weren't alone in their silos doing that work alone, and so often bringing inadequate resources to try to solve them, big challenges, small organizations trying to solve them, and that we could map that challenge space and bring organizations together to solve big challenges together, so to together take up and solve some of the problems that they couldn't on their own solve. And so we really uh, changed our own model, laser focused on the goal, but willing to adapt our approach to how we get there, from just getting great organizations on the bus, to supporting them to succeed, to helping to catalyze shared solutions. Anu, from a, the perspective of a philanthropic partner, how did that partnership change over time and evolve? You clearly supported financially, but beyond the financial support, Tell us a little bit about the other aspects. Yeah, so when we first got involved, um, as I mentioned, we were new and getting up to speed, and so we really looked to 100K and 10 to help us connect to other funders, just sort of broker conversations and help us meet other people who had shared interests and who were, had already been funding in the space, um, and also to, to broker conversations with us and other nonprofits or sort of matchmake to say, actually, you have an interest in this thing. You might want to talk to these five organizations. So that was sort of the beginning of our partnership, sort of a very um, helping us to get up to speed. And over time, um, I think this is a, just a huge uh, I have huge admiration for Talia and her leadership and how the organization has grown over the last few years, but sort of each time the organization came across a new challenge, really opening up um, opportunities for funders and partners to like roll up their sleeves and dig in and problem solve. And so one um, specific example that comes to mind is that um, Talia and the team um, organized these sort of pitch sessions, and she mentioned, sort of touched on how organizations were solving or coming across similar challenges. And then a couple years ago, there was a very uh, specific challenge around engineering education, and how do we think about um, organizations really tackling the E in STEM, when I mean, it was sort of an emphasis on the S and the M, and this is the science and the math. And so um, really, the, or, they structured an entire day around organizations coming in to think about how each organization would individually think about engineering education in their effort and bringing those nonprofits to the table to have a sort of pitch sessions to have funders and partners listen to their pitch sessions give critical feedback help them think about what would how could you implement this in your organization um, and so our, our involvement got deeper and better and more sort of um, in the weeds with the nonprofits as they were working and Talia just hit on a little bit sort of the, the, mo the most recent evolution of the work really thinking about these bigger grand challenges and again I think it's a, um, just a testament to the leadership here on really thinking about like t tackling really messy hard complex challenges and sort of thinking about 100,000 STEM teachers is a, a noble goal, but b beyond that and behind that, there's these sort of systemic challenges that if we don't start to tackle, the field will continue to suffer for decades longer. And so um, really, uh, Talia brought in 
funders and partners and advisory groups to help her think about and the team think about what does it look like for us to really roll back and figure out what are the root causes of these problems and what are some ways that we can tackle these problems collectively. And so it's been fun for us to engage in these discussions and collaborative brainstorming opportunities. And so I feel like we've just gotten deeper and deeper in the work um, over the last three years and it's been um, a, a, just a fun, it's been fun and engaging and learning and it's been more engaging than any other funder collaborative opportunity and, and really it's, it's um, most funder opportunities and um, that we've been a part of have been sort of a very surface level around we're gonna make this one shared investment and, and it ends up being a lot of time spent on like logistics, like what's your grant cycle and how much money are you gonna give and how do we get the money to the right place? Um, and I feel like here we're really tackling and thinking about interesting problems and having really good deep discussions, which has been really fun. That's fantastic. Zach, back to you. Mike uh, touched upon kind of how that relationship has changed, started off with a check and then got deeper and deeper and deeper and now you've been unleashed and you're training others to do this across the country. Um, and that all took place in the last five years? It has, and let me make it relevant for folks. So in, in the last nine years, 80% of the US population has lived in a county that's been impacted by a federally declared disaster. 80% of the United States population has been impact, lives in a county that's been impacted by a federally declared disaster. And what that means is there are Paul Joneses across our country. There are neighbors, there are cousins, there are colleagues, there's people we care about. So this is relevant, it's present, it's real. And so I just wanna, the why here is very important. And I'll be candid, it's not just about building houses, what this is, human beings have a breaking point. You know, maybe there's a, a mathematical equation, I've never gotten it right, but it's probably trauma and disaster times time, times resilience, times predictability equals people's breaking point. And so what we try and do is fortify people against their breaking point. If Paul hadn't gotten home, this was a kid who was an all-A student his first year in school. He was getting kicked out of class on an everyday basis. You can translate that to a senior in their time-limited golden years or all of us who are parents think about if we could ever really be at present at work or home with our family if we don't know when we're gonna be able to move home. So it's a big deal. The, the relationship changed. Um, the money's important, but what's really useful with Toyota is they didn't teach us just how to build houses. They taught us how to think. They changed our culture. When we started working together, we were the good guys. We had built all these houses, but we didn't talk about problems. And so you can't do TPS. You have to be it. And so the first change that happened is we had to establish a new organizational ethos, which is something we call constructive discontent. So on, on one hand, we have to be hearable. All of us at some point um, have assassinated a good message with a crummy delivery, um, both at home or at work. So we have to be hearable and in the people serving world. We can't assassinate a good message with a crummy delivery. At the same time, we have to be discontent. Frederick Douglass said, where there's no struggle, there's no progress. If we're happy with results, we have to do things the same way. If we're dissatisfied with results, we have to be willing to do things differently. So it was that core ethos of constructive discontent that uh, the people who know me, this is scary, but unleashed us. And so what, I'll, I'll tell you where we are now, we're building houses in seven communities across the country, but our mandate has changed. It, it is no longer simply to build houses for people. It's to reduce the time between disaster and recovery. So we're no longer a Band-Aid organization. It feels great to build someone's house and there's nothing we finished a summer house for a World War II veteran. I share a birthday, it hit home. Everyone was in tears, it was beautiful, but that feeling of joy at him moving home uh, was predicated or allowed on, by one thing, and it was his 10 years of suffering. So <laughs> it can't merely be you respond after and feel good about it. Toyota has this um, problem-solving methodology that's now trained to our 190 AmeriCorps members nationwide and it's the five whys. We utilize the five whys to determine what SBP's mandate is gonna be. If what we, at the end of the day, we want people to shrink the time between disaster and recovery, what are the, in essence, it's a critical path, what are the reasons they're not? And it shaped our interventions in the very work we do. So we build and we build in an innovative way. And Toyota, I should take a step back, has this notion of Yoko 10. 
that also is incredibly inspiring to us. It, roughly, it means um, if you do it well, you have to share it. Hmm. And when we saw this for-profit company, Yoko Tenning with competitors and other for-profit companies, um, sharing their best practices with other in-industry competitors, we realized that in the people-serving world, there's a moral imperative to do that. So the first thing we do is we build in an innovative way, trying to be the vanguard, learn best practices. Second, we train other groups. Currently, we're training three habitats all around the country, rebuilding togethers and some ground-up organizations. We're completely um, open source. Anything that we do, we'll share with others. The mission isn't, success isn't just us building someone's house. We serve the pool of people who have been impacted, and so we don't care who does it. We want to raise efficacy across the industry. Third, we do a whole host of pre-disaster resilience work. Fourth, and this is something that was uncovered through kind of a painful 5 why um, exercise, we understood that we had to influence the way the state governments get and then spend dollars. If you think of like a funnel, we want to increase the funnel. We can deal with the pipeline on the back end, but we need to increase the velocity and the breadth of the funnel and the timepiece as soon as possible. And then we do some in um, industry advocacy, but that all came from, it's not mission creep. These are very precise interventions designed to achieve what the mandate is, and that's to shrink the time between disaster and recovery. And I'm convinced if we didn't work with Toyota, we would have been this you know, nice bat packing group, proud of all the houses we built, rather than having these interventions that are designed to make sure that Paul Jones ideally doesn't even need our help in the first place. Well, Zach, you're a great leader uh, to, to take that all and, and actually really challenge the organization to rethink your mission and, and your approach. So um, it's, he speaks your great leadership. Mike, um, you had something to say, but I also want you to address how, you don't only work with St. Bernard, you work with other organizations too. How have others approached partnership with Toyota and how did they express the concept of Yokotan? Well, and then I can transition back to him. So we, we work with general industry clients, and many of these are manufacturers. Um, I might be sitting right now on a chair manufactured in Michigan by the Herman Miller Furniture Company. And um, when we started working with them actually 20 years ago, they were about to lose their business to um, cheap labor overseas, or they were going to be forced to chase cheap labor. And um, they now have the Herman Miller production system, and they're one of the most um, incredible examples of the Yokotin of Toyota production system in this country. So we've, we've helped a lot of U.S. businesses learn how to compete on U.S. soil. And I've heard President Clinton say this many times, we can compete in this country if we learn, if these manufacturers learn how to solve just some of their basic uh, production issues. And we also try to work um, uh, on an annual basis with about 30 nonprofits. Uh, we've worked with, with a lot of food banks. Um, and, you know, at a food bank or a food pantry, there's volunteers in there working and and they're trying to assemble packages of food or whatever. And because they're volunteers, they don't necessarily see a, a better process to it. Um, the Food Bank of New York City, unfortunately, that's 1,000 locations in New York. <laughs> when you count all of them that say they're part of the Food Bank of New York City, it's overwhelming, actually. And they've become a model, and in fact, they have their own process people who are now sharing pro Toyota production system within all of those food banks. That, that makes us very, very happy. Um, we've worked with some government organizations, some uh, mayors who are more business-minded, who see a better way to, to do things. Um, we've worked with the state of New York on the uh, permitting process. Ask, ask any business in the state of New York what it's like to get a permit. Um, so we feel like Toyota production system can be applied in many, many ways. There's been a lot of talk about problem solving, and that's kind of what Toyota is. We're an army of 30,000 plus people in North America who are problem solvers who really want to get to the root cause of issues. We found a like-minded partner in Zach 
um, who really, he sees rebuilding homes as only a Mm Band-Aid, okay? He and I have talked over a few adult beverages before about how ideally he would never have to rebuild a home again if we solve the root cause issues. And many of them are underinsured uh, homeowners who are in disaster areas, and, and many of those are low-income people. And so Zach now spends a lot of his time addressing those issues. We love it that he's going around the country now teaching people and small businesses how to be properly insured for the day that they're in that 80%. Um, so I think it's important for nonprofits to understand a, a company like ours really wants a like-minded partner who wants to solve problems and not just take our money and put a Band-Aid on things. And we, we have a lot to share, you know, to help organizations who want to do that. Mike, can I comment on that? And, and um, Only if it's positive. It, well, <laughs> it's positive in that it talks about problems. I just want to pull out a, a theme here that progress occurs when NGOs, when supported by funders, are comfortable talking about what doesn't work. And That's going to be the next question. And I was just going to also call out the theme, which is for 100K and 10, so the, the critical need were all these kids who were in classrooms without, sometimes literally without a, a science teacher or a math teacher, without anybody at all, uh, and sometimes just without a qualified one. And we know that is true in in thousands and thousands of classrooms around the around the country. In every major school district, when school opened this year, there were classrooms, often for poor kids, often for kids of color or immigrants, that, where they started with a substitute, someone who was shoved in at the last minute to teach those kids because they didn't have enough teachers. Um, and so getting those teachers in front is, is critical and it's life-saving for those kids and for their chances. But what we started to focus on as we realized we were going to hit the 100,000 goal is why, and we also, we are deep in the five whys process, why is it that in so many classrooms it is impossible to get a great STEM teacher? Why is it that in so many districts, um, and, and really in every city in this country and in every town, uh, it's so hard to keep them once you get them in, why so many of them leave? And when we started to unpack that, we realized that the work of 100K and 10 with this national network and the amazing organizations committed to this cause wasn't about delivering the 100,000 STEM teachers. It was about mapping these whys and then activating a network to solve them. Why is it that teaching has such low prestige, especially for high-performing STEM undergraduates? Why is it that if you want to advance and earn more as a teacher, you need to leave the classroom? Why aren't there opportunities for growth to keep you teaching kids? Uh, Why is it that There's so few opportunities for scientists, technologists, mathematicians, engineers, folks who do STEM their full time to get into classrooms and work with kids and with teachers there to continue to inspire those kids and teachers. Those were the questions. Those were the challenges that were making this goal so hard. And our job here and the job of the network was actually to stop band-aiding that and to change the operating environment in which teachers and kids were functioning all the time so that when we delivered these 100,000, we wouldn't have to start the clock all over again to get the next set of 100,000 because all the same systemic issues were still there. And that, I think, is the, um, it's, so, it's so wonderful to hear it here because I think it is so hard when you're doing this mission critical work not to just do the work that's right in front of you. You see the need, you want to go help it, you want to um, heal the patient, you want to build the house, you want to, to pr- support the teacher, but we, all those things show up in an environment that has made those problems systemic, that has made them so hard to solve in this country. And what it needs all of us to do is to get underneath those, to get to those root causes and start to work there. So. Absolutely. Zach, um, do pick up from that. And, and you were also talking about how this work is hard and there are challenges. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, so if we're dissatisfied with outcomes, we've got to be willing to do things differently. And we have to talk about what doesn't work. I applaud funders like the two up here and others that I know are in the room um, who are willing to get in the weeds with organizations and create a, a comfort zone where they can talk about what's not working, where are the failures. Um, And I think there's an imperative, though, for the NGOs to do the same thing and not create these shiny, sexy, hollow reports, but rather talk about what's not working. Uh, And that can occur when the NGO funder partnership 
is a real partnership. It's not transactional, but it's a relationship. And that, that can happen, but I, I think it, it comes both ways. I think the funders, I really encourage you um, to make clear that what you want is impact. You understand there may be some stumbles along the way, um, and you want to talk about what's not working. And then for the NGOs, there just has to be some, if we're really committed not just to staying in business, ideally to work ourselves out of a business, we, um, we need to talk about what those barriers are or, or the impediments are along the way. I just want to underscore from the funder perspective here, um, as an emerging foundation and sort of a growing and learning foundation, just underscore this point around um, us modeling for our partners and for our nonprofits so what it means to learn and to admit mistake and to say we messed up on this and we're going to do it better in these ways next year. And um, we know this process you know, didn't work the way that we said it was going to work. And, and um, and here's what you can expect for next year. And so I think uh, that comes back to sort of us as foundations and partners really modeling that process of failure and learning as well. Can I share one last thing about it? So if you think about businesses, look at Amazon. Before they finally got it right, they had three platforms that failed along the way. There's this whole notion of the lean startup. You have to design, fail, iterate, move forward. Um, one thing that I've put out there in the the past that I think would be interesting would be a failure fund. It may be that success is right around the corner from that last failure, but if it doesn't work, people abandon it and try a new sexy, shiny thing. And so maybe at CGI, what I just put out there is if there's interest, um, potentially we could talk about curating a failure fund. So I'll, I'll follow up with a couple of really concrete examples. Uh, at our last year's summit, and every year we bring, because the partners asked for it, we bring all the partners together for intensive learning, ideating opportunities. Uh, we, we talked about failure and the importance of failure in classrooms and for teachers and the importance of failure at the system level and for nonprofits. And uh, the woman who publishes the Engineers Without Borders Failure Report uh, came up on stage to do a lightning talk, super short, seven minutes. And she said, when I say the word failure, what do you think about? And people just call that shame, embarrassment. You know? And then she said, I represent an organization that every year publishes its seven best failures in the failure report. Tell me what you think about us. And everyone's like, brave, incredible, path-breaking. Mm -hmm. And so she spent the time talking about what the distance is there and how do we celebrate failure. We, we, walked, we walked the walk knowing that if you're going to ask, if we're going to ask the nonprofits to be willing to be vulnerable and to admit their failure, we need to do the same. So in our annual report, I brought a few here, we talked about our failures. They get a big shiny page all about the things that didn't work in the last year and why we think that is. Uh, because it's easy to say it, but it's really hard to do it. And then we've uh, created fellowships that are problem solving, uh, design based fellowships that get at root causes that give the nonprofits that participate a chance to play in the space of trying to create solutions to actually prototype them and bring them to the users to experiment with them with them there with the real people who will use them. And then when we do the funding, we say you can be ready to, uh, to implement or you might need more time in the play space and we will fund you either way. Like it is okay to fail, to have prototyped something, to bring it to end users, and to realize it doesn't work, we will still support you in that space to keep going because that's, that's what we want. We want people to admit that this thing that they designed on paper didn't work when they brought it out and not design that thing with a million dollars of funding and then discover that it doesn't work. And so if we were gonna um, ask people to do that, we needed to back it up with funds and we got you know, a whole range of funders from across the country to buy into that and to support it with us. And so they gave the funds to these organizations to stay in the play space until they got it right. And people stayed there as long as they needed until they got it right and then applied for the full funds to implement. And now there are all these organizations doing this engineering work with teachers all around the country who have played and experimented and failed and learned with each other and admitted those failures and gotten stronger together and then uh, done the right work. That's great, and, and it's, it's just, if you take a step back about looking at these partnerships, I mean, what's really palpable, even on stage in this public setting, is the underlying trust, and obviously it took years to develop, and it's a safe place where you can celebrate failure together and learn together. Do you have, insofar that there are funders out there, do, do you have some practical tips as to how you got to this place to? you know, together on this journey, what are the shared values? How did you, you know, kind of get into this kitchen? We joke sometimes that we have sort of two angels on our shoulders. One is um, 
like Saul Alinsky and Cesar Chavez were deep organizers on the one hand, and then we have like our inner Steve Jobs over here, who's like, I know it, I see it, I see what you all aren't seeing. And there's a little bit of like the tension between those two, like sometimes because we're talking to so many organizations, because we're hearing so much from around the country, we can see through lines that aren't always obvious to others, but we're also deeply immersed in connecting to and learning from the partners, from teachers. Um, we're on the ground all over and all the time, and I feel like I'm holding those two places, having something to share that is the, the insight that comes mm -hmm. of the learning mm -hmm. and being deeply committed to listening, to learning, to not having the solutions. Um, for us as a network, we are always in the background. Like We rarely are the ones out there talking. We're up there always putting the partners in front for the work that they're doing and for the insights that they're um, breaking through with. And so I think um, the combination of putting ourselves in the back and letting other people be up front, listening deeply, and then being able to see through lines that might not be obvious as sort of differentiating the signal from the noise mm -hmm. um, have really enabled us to, to build deep trust. And from that place of trust, I think that one of the things you're hearing across the board is a willingness to be honest and to call the questions when you see them, to not go for the easy solutions. Um, they're appealing, they're right there, and they're sometimes like literally the life-saving work that feels like it needs to happen, but to be able to go there and then through them to the, the deep challenges that might be making those problems so hard in the first place. I think that all of that builds a level of trust and a willingness to go at it together um, that without that, networks and coalitions and partnerships just crumble. I would just underscore, like, just like I think um, to Talia's point, sort of this sort of level of trust and vulnerability brings sort of likely and unlikely allies together. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Talia has a great example of sort of the American Federation of Teachers, the AFT, sitting in the same room as district schools and charter schools sitting at, joining the same coalition, sitting at the same table, having a conversation about what they can collectively do towards a shared problem. And I think without that level of trust, you just wouldn't be able to see that kind of collaboration and um, real problem solving. I'm glad you mentioned shared value. Um, we're, I, I don't even want to use the word philanthropy any longer. We're, we're looking to form partnerships to have real impact on society that could also drive our business. You may be wondering how can we possibly drive our business through a partnership with Zach. Um, we're, our Toyota production system guys get better every day at what they do by working with his team. So they learn things. I've learned how to work with a philanthropic partner in more of a 360 degree approach. It's really dawned on us, we have so much more to offer um, to, to any organization, all kinds of expertise, not just our money. Right. Um, so I've learned how to engage in partnerships in a better way, and it's really um, transformative for Toyota. We, we, historically, we've written a bunch of checks to a lot of charities, and we've really, truly had no idea about the impact of that spending. We can have a greater impact if we get a little more focused and apply more of our resources. So I've learned that from Zach. I've learned it from CGI meetings over the years that um, bringing more of these partners to bear and more assets to bear can really level up impact. Beautifully said, Mike, and, and the wisdom and humility that you bring to this work. And it, it's so often, you know, when you are the corporation, you are the funder, um, you are um, not treating your N NGO as a peer, right? It's a top-down, it's a very different kind of relationship, and it really, um, it's, it's just so inspiring to hear it uh, from you. So thank you for your leadership. Zach, you want to take us home before we open up to the audience? Sure, just one, um, one thought. Partnerships with companies should include not just dollars, but should really focus on sense. What is the company excellent at that can make your business processes better? I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about spending money. We're talking about working more efficiently. And if you think about what you can spend on consultants and outside partners, I think if we can really create these synergistic partnerships uh, where companies invest not just dollars but cents and where, you know, we want, last thought, uh, we want these partnerships to be sustainable. 
And I think we have to understand what our corporate partners' business drivers are, be cognizant of those, and to make a, a relationship sustainable, there has to be, it has to fit with one of their clear business objectives. And so let's find it. And it can be an employer of choice model. It can be exposure. It can be employee development. It can be R&D. It can be sales. It can be with one partner. We, we benchmark at, you know, if there's three things, awareness, consideration, action, we benchmark on consideration. They do polling on it. There's nothing wrong with that. If we want to, we add value to them, let's create some real clear business objectives. Zach and I are already talking about what the next phase of our relationship looks like. Um, I mean, I mentioned environmental sustainability. Um, we save money by being a zero landfill operation. I know it doesn't sound like it could work that way. I think I could save him a couple million dollars. He Because he uses uh, AmeriCorps and volunteers, he's, I'm not saying they're incompetent, but they're not home builders. And it would only take one workplace accident to bring his organization to its knees. And I wanna help him avoid that because we have pretty safe workplace in our plant, so we have expertise to bring to bear. We're talking about how to tap into that AmeriCorps team. I'd like for some of them to become Toyota team members. <laughs> They've already got the mindset to support society. They're a bunch of smart young people, which is why we're training them in problem solving. We're talking about how do I take a social innovation staff member on my team, embed them in St. Bernard for six months or a year. He sends one of his people to me embedded at a corporation for six months to a year. And then imagine the learnings about how to work together in the future. Um, when I go to Japan to seek approval for the next phase, they're going to want to know how many houses were rebuilt. And we can give a number, but I'm going to keep saying to them, we want to lower that number of houses <laughs> by doing these things on the front end to solve the problem. The root cause. Now, what's the Japanese word for root cause? I've been trying to wonder. wonder. Anyway, as you think about that, Mike. I have Japanese colleagues in the audience, and they're shaking their head like, no. It's such a constant theme. Well, thank you for that extraordinary conversation. I'd love for folks to uh, stand up, introduce yourself, um, ask a question to our panelists, and uh, make sure that the question is actually a question. <laughs> Please, I think um, someone is going to hand you the mic. Thanks, Tim. I mean, I, <clears throat> I think it was a great conversation. So I, my question was both to the organizations, but also the funders in this idea of failure. Um, we we are impact investors, and we invest in innovation that um, you know needs failure as well. And we see it all the time. But failure can indicate either the model doesn't work or incompetence and dysfunction. And so how do you, you know, bring your funders in, but also as a funder, how do you differentiate this is an organization that failed but is working towards a goal that I want to be a part of? Great question. We think a lot about uh, what kind of failure, because there, there are failures you really don't want to see, because you didn't think through the problem hard enough, because you didn't test it with real people, because, uh, because you executed really poorly. And, and as, a, as a leader also of a team that's really pushing hard and trying to do ambitious things, like I, that, those are the failures I hold res myself responsible for. Like those are failures we don't want to see. And then there are the right failures. You tried something really hard. You knew what the risks were. It was worth trying, and it didn't work. But I learned a ton about why it didn't work, and I'm willing to try it again. And I've made the changes in it. Um, that, that indicate to me that I can, when I try it again, do something. That I, 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 I failed fast. I didn't spend a ton of time in my room perfecting the model, like all alone, and then I got it all funded and I went and did it and didn't work. Like those are ways we don't want to fail. You want to, I want to fail because I, I thought hard, I did some learning, I put it out there, I got feedback, it didn't work right, and I made it better. And I think it's really about pushing into that place, into that space of experimentation and knowing that if you're experimenting, failure is embedded in it. So it's almost like 
re, how we like rebrand the idea of what we do in the first place. We don't put out a great idea and it fails. We are constantly learning and improving. And part of improving and learning is that things don't always work exactly right. Um, and then, so we, we act both as, as nonprofits doing the work and as funders funding that work. And so we sort of wear hats on, wear both of those hats. And I, I guess the key is, like, what are the elements of learning that you can embed in a process of testing with real people, of failing fast and learning from it and improving and making a decision about when is it good enough to go, and then not stopping the learning at implementation. So often with funders, you expect that once you've funded a project, it's, they're going to like mechanistically follow exactly what they said they would do until the end of the grant cycle. And in our most recent grants, we actually blew that up. And we said, uh, we're going to network you in a learning community with everyone else who's solving the same problem. And we're actually going to check in with you every three to six months and ask you, what have you learned? And based on what you've learned, what have you changed? And how's that going to change your approach? And the, the measure now of success is not did you hit your benchmarks, it's did you learn? Did you learn and what did you change? And so actually like the failing and the changing is what is rewarded and what we're going to share with all of our, all of our funders as we try to bring these ideas to scale. Totally agree with, with that. Um, failure and change are okay as long as the change part happens. We see a lot of dysfunction <laughs> um, and incompetence. Um, when we are making decisions about who to support with Toyota Production System, we actually insist that top management of a company or either the nonprofit um, is going to be heavily engaged or we will walk away. There have been instances where a CEO will say, oh sure, I'm, I'm totally in, and then his own team members, his own employees who do the work are not seeing that kind of support to actually make change that they know will improve their processes. And so we've walked away from a few. Um, but early on through that vetting process, if we see that kind of commitment from the very top, we're in and there will be success. Case in point. Anu, you yeah, wanted to add that? I would say that? from our perspective, I think I would just underscore some of the comments that Talia made. And I think we are now in our third full year of grant making. And so we are starting our grants, working with our partners to say, what are the goals you hope to accomplish this year? What are the learning questions you'll be able to answer by this time next year? What, what are the data points you're gonna be looking at, quantitative or qualitative? And, and on what frequency should we be talking and figuring that collect, uh, sort of par in a partnership-oriented way for us to be understanding, are we on the right track or uh, are we on the wrong track? And at what point do we make decisions to pivot or persevere? Um, and those are collective sort of a joint conversations. And I think the question that we look to ourselves to ask and to our partners is, are you getting better over time? And so this is under, so that underscoring, underlining that sort of improvement-oriented lens. Um, you know, it's not accountability for did you achieve these grant goals, you know, red, yellow, green. It's are you getting better at hitting, making sort of more efficient or better mistakes over time? We should try to TPS a grant process, Mike. <laughs> we can try. <laughs> I love that idea. A question over here. Hi, I'm Alistair. I'm the director of a nonprofit called Libraries Without Borders. Thank you so much for this discussion. Um, I heard you know, a lot of innovative models of partnerships between corporations, foundations, and nonprofits, and observed that there was little mention of government. And I would appreciate to hear your thoughts on if that was an active decision in the partnership not to partner closely with them, if it was something that you um, just didn't mention in the panel, and how, how you're thinking about uh, uh, partnerships with a, th a third sector uh, as well. It's an excellent question, and I think Tali and Zach should answer that. We've, we've been really fortunate to be pretty closely partnered with uh, the Obama administration and have partners across um, school districts, elected officials, governors, uh, mayors, state superintendents of education. So a lot of that third leg of the stool. And in fact, as we think about these grand challenges and getting at the root causes, we are supremely conscious of how important government and policymakers are going to be to anchor some of the solutions for these challenges. One of the things we realized, though, in starting 100K in 10, and a lot of why 
we've since learned that in the White House, when they think about how to create a multi-sector response to a big challenge, they'll say, how do we 100K intend this, is that government uh, isn't in this moment, for better or worse, in a position to solve most of the problems we face. They're an important supporting actor, uh, and they have unbelievable pulpit, right? Like a, a place from which to put out a call, an amazing bully pulpit and a, and a bullhorn. But they are rarely, they're so shackled right now and rarely in a place to actually do the solving. And so in our, in our instance, the government and the president, in the form of the president, put out a call. The private sector responded, nonprofit and corporate, responded to that call. And as a result, the president kept at it. So that, that call was among many in the State of the Union in 2011, and we don't hear about any of them anymore. But for the next years, all the way through uh, his re-election campaign at the second inaugural and beyond, he kept talking about the 100,000 goal, because by then there had been literally hundreds of organizations that had stood up and said, we're, we're on it. We've got your back on this goal, and we're going to deliver on it. And uh, that, that thing is a necessary piece of the, the nonprofit and for-profit sector in responding to what the public sector can put out the call for but cannot do alone. Zach? So I think your, your five why or your root cause analysis will tell you nine out of 10 times that the government is an essential partner. Um, so you're nodding, you know the answer. Like of, of course we've got to, if, if we're all trying to really address the root, we have to work with government. I think there's a couple things to remember. Um, one, if they're saying no, they're not bad people or they're not our enemies, right? We really have to engage government with the belief that people are coming from a good position and it's a heck of a lot easier to pull a string than pu push a string. Being a trial lawyer, I got this wrong more often than I got it right in the very beginning. It certainly helped with a different administration. Second, understanding, I, th I think as was just said, like what governments can actually do and what they can't do and there's a lot more influence or spotlight that can happen. I think we often look for the government to throw the money it can come, but you need the proof points first. And if we're talking about fear of failure that the gentleman just asked, that's not going to come with government dollars. So you need your proof points first. We're getting more focused on mobility issues in this country and, in fact, around the world. Um, but we know we're not the be all and end all. So we're, in fact, all over the world developing partnerships to help solve, like, some big city transportation issues. That's got to have government at the table, nonprofits, um, all the other kind of agencies that move people around. Um, we've consolidated our North American headquarters into Dallas, Texas. Um, I'm moving there sometime soon. <laughs> and, you know, Dallas is very happy that, you know, we're adding 5,000 people to the equation there. But people said, you're just adding to the traffic issue we have. <laughs> so we're talking about doing a Dallas mobility project where we're an expert but also a convener where we feel like we can bring all those entities together to really work together to solve these issues. And if you look at a metroplex like Dallas-Fort Worth, there's a bunch of small governments. We're actually in the city of Plano. Uh, a bunch of small governments. There's DART. There's all these agencies that move people around that need to be at the table talking about this issue holistically or it'll lead to failure. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question because, um, and, and next time we'll highlight that aspect even uh, further, but uh, the idea of having government at the table, uh, whatever level of government that uh, your organization's working with is, is core, and you need to design that from the beginning. Um, and uh, I think it would be foolish to think about, you know, working outside of the system, not engaging with government, because at the end of the day, you know, that is when solutions can be implemented at scale, and this is obviously very core to my day job at social finance uh, around our work and pay for success, and that pillar, uh, uh, close engagement with the public sector is, uh, really uh, the way to drive systemic changes. All of us appreciate. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Please. away from this meeting, and I work with genocide survivors and ex-offenders and make jewelry to give them second chances. How can I find out more information about Toyota production systems? Is it something that's public? 
you can learn more about how we do this on a website called tssc.com. Um, you can also see a, a few amazing short films uh, about this work. One of them is about Zach's organization. Tell them what you said when they showed the video, Mike. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> Zach's big face is on this film, and I said, you've got a face made for radio. <laughs> <laughs> Only friends and close partners can talk to each other like that. Trust. <laughs> um, that website's called toyotaeffect.com, and then I can hand you a card after this if you want to chat further. Well, thank you so much for this fantastic conversation. Um, I think all of us here, to our partners at CGI and CGI America, we're all getting very nostalgic. But I think that it's amazing to see these partnerships being birthed at CGI America and to see the work of CGI America live on through these partners on the ground. So thank you to all the staff and uh, for making this happen. Alex and, and Nick and everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, the breakout session is now concluded. The plenary session will begin in the Metropolitan Ballroom at 11 a.m.